Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study. I'm so thankful you're here with us today. We're going to continue our study in Ephesians, uh, learning how God sees us, what God says about us, so that hopefully we can fully manifest not only his identity that he has for us, but also the purpose and the ministry that he calls us to. But let's start off our time together with a prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace and your love. I pray that you will be with us this morning and guide us as we dive into your word, that your Holy Spirit will speak to each of us in a way that that you want us to hear and that we will respond to the prompting that comes to us through your word and through your spirit. Father, we pray for our world right now, Lord. We um, we pray for your kingdom to come and whether that means Jesus returns or whether that means we as members of your kingdom fully embody your love and your peace to this world. We pray for that, Father. We pray for healing. We pray for healing to this terrible virus that's hurting so many people. We pray for those who are going through economic hardships. We pray for those who've lost loved ones. Father, I just pray that your peace that passes understanding will just reign over this world. And Father, we just thank you for your son, Jesus, who taught us how to love and loved us enough to die for us. And once again, we just invite your Holy Spirit into this time together. In Jesus' name, together we say amen. All right, take a look at these pictures. Tell me, what do all of these images have in common? Apologize for the blurry one. That's Downton Abbey, one of my favorite shows. <laughs> if you thought, well, these all have to do with relationships where one holds power or authority over another, you would be right. And that's our topic for today is relationships and how we interact in relationships. We're coming to the end of our study in Ephesians. In the first three chapters, Paul mainly reminded the Ephesians and also us as Christians today about who we are in Jesus. We are chosen and accepted by him. We are purposed to be a part of his ministry of reconciliation. We are powerful. In fact, the Holy Spirit that is in us is that very same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So that was chapters one through three. And now we're in four through six. And in these last chapters, Paul has talked about what the effect of becoming all these things through Jesus should be, um, that it should be transforming us and empowering us, that the effect, as we've studied in the last two lessons, is that we are changed and we are enlightened. And now he says we are submissive, which to us sounds strange because in our society, we don't always view the word submissive as, as something that you want to be. But God says that's what we are. That's what he calls us to be. This is how Max Lucado talks about this next section. He says, Paul reaches the heart of his practical theology. He focuses briefly on three crucial relationships that will test our understanding of cooperation with one another and obedience to God. He talks about marriage, family, and work relationships. So let's go ahead and dive into our passage. Ephesians 5, 21 through chapter 6, verse 9. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. 
because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Paul had just implored the Ephesians to be enlightened to their calling to be the light of the world. He spent the first 20 verses of this chapter talking about how they would respond in situations as enlightened members of the church. But now he's moving on to what our relationships will look like. In fact, that's how he kicked off this section, by saying, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In the New Century Version, this verse is read as yield to obey each other as you would to Christ. The message says, out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. And the Living Bible says, honor Christ by submitting to each other. The Greek for that submit or yield um, comes, or that courteously reverent, comes from the word hippotasso, I believe that's how you would pronounce it, which actually means properly under God's arrangement, uh, submitting to the Lord or his plan. And so although our world and our culture might not look favorably on the concept of being submissive, this is God's plan for us. It's what he modeled through Jesus and what he wills for us. Barth, in, in I think the Bible that he provided editorial comments for, is called the Anchor Bible. He said he defined it like this, a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. This word, it wouldn't necessarily have been used at the time by Greeks or Jews to talk about marriage, but instead it would have, would have referred to um, the context of respecting military authority. So it does mean, it does refer to those moments when perhaps there is those situations where someone is over authority in you, or maybe where it's a partnership as in a marriage, but where there's a disagreement and a decision needs to be made, or someone has to take the lead and you yielding or submitting to that leadership. Much like Jesus, Paul's teaching to the Ephesians was counter to the culture in which they lived in. Um, it's interesting to note that in this passage, he doesn't just talk to um, he doesn't just talk to the wives and the slaves and the children, the ones who at that time in that culture would have been seen as less than. He talks to both and and has has um, expectations for both of them, and that is really counter culture to the time. Much like Jesus, Jesus did the same thing. Uh, he held both roles as equally accountable, as equally valuable, and as equally worthy of dignity. You also have to keep in mind the Ephesian church was an eclectic group that contained members functioning in all the roles mentioned. There were husbands, but there were wives. There were parents, there were children, there were masters, and there were servants or slaves who would come. Uh, in Roman times, slaves, although they didn't have many rights, they were allowed the right to practice their religion, and so the slave could go to the church. Also, you have to remember that in society at that time, wives, children, and slaves were often treated as little more than property. <clears throat> so it's significant that Paul addressed all of them as, as, as if they were equal, although the roles in society did not, did not have equal footing in that one that was in a position of authority over the other. He addressed all. And so by doing that, he extends that value and dignity to all the individuals, despite what their role is. This is the way the Life Change Bible study on Ephesians says. P P uh, Paul, not Peter, Paul seems to have felt that any relationship would be abusive if a self-centered person was in it seeking control. Whereas any relationship, no matter how outwardly authoritarian, would benefit both persons if each had Christ's lordship and the other person's highest good at heart. So we know the meaning of submission is that we are reverently honoring one another. Um, the application of it in this culture was not just for those who were in a role where they did not have authority. It was for all Christians. And so I think that's important to remember. So now let's talk about our ability to submit. The Life Change Bible Study had a question in it that really made me think. I think it's applicable to the time we're living in right now. How should a Christian respond to directions that he or she finds unpleasant, but not unbiblical from those in authority over him or her? 
if you notice the pattern in the scripture, I took out every part where he speaks directly to these different subgroups, to the wives, to the husbands, to the children, the fathers, the slaves, the masters. And notice there's always a common thing. What is it that you see that's common? What I see is that the submission and the loving and the treating kindly all are connected to the Lord, not just to the person. Wives submit as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey just as you would obey Christ. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. I really love that part there because Paul just kind of says, um, it's almost like um, when you, you think about, you know, God's watching you, God's got his eye on you. And he just makes that point. God's watching not just the slave, but you as well. You're accountable for your actions and how you treat those over which you have placed yourself in authority. So I think it's important to note that my ability to submit is not connected so much to the person to whom I'm submitting as much as it is a direct reflection of my respect for and my trust in God. I, I am able to submit because of him, not because of anything that that a human being might bring to me or do for me. It's not transactional. I've been transformed. And so my submission and my abilities to submit in situations, to submit to one another, as Paul calls us to do, is going to reflect the amount at which the, the, the depth of my respect for God and his sovereignty in my life and my trust in him. I can submit if I know that God's overall. And whatever happens, even if I don't get my way or my preference, whatever happens is going to be okay because God's got it. And so my ability to submit is going to be based on how much I respect and trust God. This not only applies to my relationships in my family or in my job, but also in regard to my government. Now, this isn't mentioned in Ephesians, but Peter in 2 Peter 3 reminds us that we need to submit to authorities. Um, he says, and this is the message, ex exercise your freedom. We like to talk about freedom here. Exercise your freedom by serving God, not by breaking the rules. Treat everyone you meet with dignity. Love your spiritual family. Revere God. Respect the government. So I think that we have to remember that submission within our relationships is also submission within our society or within our culture. So here are some final thoughts. This is a short lesson this week. I want you to think about these questions. How submissive am I in my relationships? How submissive am I to authority? And what does my level of submissiveness, submissiveness say about my trust in God and my respect for God? Because if I have truly been transformed and enlightened by God's spirit, if I trust his words to me, that he says, I am chosen, I'm accepted, I'm empowered, then I will choose to be a submissive person in my relationships, to honor and respect those around me, particularly those in authority. Um, and, and submission can submission is required of me whether I'm in a leadership role or if I'm in a follower role. Submission can happen in either of those. As a leader, I can be a servant leader who truly listens to those I'm, I am leading and, and involves them in decision making and, and helps them feel capable and worthy and respects their autonomy. So it goes both ways. It doesn't, it's not just if I'm in a following position, if I'm in a leadership role, I can still submit to one another, it's reverently honor them, as the message puts it. This makes me think of something going on right now. I don't know about you, but my Facebook feed is quite full these days of people talking about these masks. And uh, now, especially here in our communities, you know, it's been mandated by law. And so the mask debates are raging on. Some people object. They say it's my God given right to refuse to wear a mask and the government can't dictate that. And while there's some merit to that argument, I mean, we were called to be free. I'm not 
sure it can totally uh, be given be given sway. Others will make the appeal that I should wear a mask to protect others, and that's a noble reason, or because of science or to avoid paying a fine. But here's the thing. If I'm a Christian, it's not about my God-given right. It's not about my political beliefs about the role of government. It's not even about my belief or my disbelief in science. It's not about any of that. It's about my walk with God. I wear the mask, even though it, I don't want to, it's uncomfortable. I wear the mask as a reflection of my reverence to God. I submit because of my trust and respect for God. It's about my walk with God. Regardless of how I feel about it, I revere God. I revere Jesus. So I really should not need any other motivation to submit to that authority, even though I don't necessarily, whether I agree with it or not. Ephesians is our call into the ministry of God. And that ministry doesn't happen at scheduled times in certain places. It, it encompasses all of our lives. We can't forget that our relationships are a part of our ministry of reconciliation. Those of us who have accepted our, accepted our calling, we're called to be submissive to one another. There's no getting around it. I can't just go, well, forget that. I'm going to do all of these other things, but I'm not going to be submissive. It's just part of it. There's no getting around it. It's not easy. It's not natural to us, but it is doable if we are empowered by his spirit and understand who it is we are really submitting to. We're really submitting to God. This, uh, this passage this week and in and, and studying for this lesson, I kept thinking about Mother Teresa. Um, you know, Mother Teresa, she uh, is a Catholic nun who felt called by Jesus at the age of 12 to serve others. He, she felt a deep calling. And then when she was 18, she became a nun. Initial, initially, she served as a teacher and a principal at a school. But then she received what she refers to as a call within the call. She was riding on a train through the neighborhoods of Calcutta. And she felt specifically that Jesus was telling her to serve the poor in Calcutta. And so that's the ministry she pursued. She submitted to that call. And so through that ministry, she opened leper colonies and orphanages, nursing homes and family clinics. And she founded a congregation of women who were dedicated to helping the poor. Her life was one of submission to the call of Jesus. And this quote by her is one of my favorites. And it applies to what we study today. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good. Give the world the best you have and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. So God says I am submissive and I submit, whether it's submitting to one another, whether it's submitting my relationships or submitting to the authorities that are in my life, I submit out of reverence to God because, as she says, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. I must grasp this truth that Mother Teresa shares that Paul refers to over and over again. And this is the truth that my interactions with others has a direct impact on my interaction with God. Uh, I could also say that my interactions with God will have a direct impact on my interactions with others. So I encourage you and I encourage me this week to really think about how submissive I am in my relationships and what my level of submissiveness says about my trust in God. Let's close out in prayer. Father, as your children, we have submitted to you. We trust in your power. We respect your sovereignty. Help us to understand that our submission to one another, the way we interact and the way we respond to authority is a direct reflection of our respect for you and our trust in you. Help us love others in a way that deepens our loves, our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So next week, we finish out Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 10 through 19. God says, I'm equipped. And I would encourage you, take some time to week, this week to read those scriptures from Ephesians 6 um, so that when we come together next week, we can be blessed by the power 
that they give us. Thank you again for joining me. I hope you have a great week.